Okay, well, welcome back. Um, I'm glad to see so many people returning from uh, all over the place. I uh, hope you enjoyed last week and um, tried to answer uh, some of the questions that were left over from last time. And hopefully we'll have an opportunity for some um, Q&A uh, after uh, tonight's session as well. Uh, but I'm gonna share my screen as I usually do if I have the right thing up. No, I guess I don't. Hold on just a sec. Um, <laughs> Just a sec. Uh, there we are. All right. Now, we'll try again. Share screen. There we go. OK. So, <clears throat> Uh, last time we had a general overview of some of the introductory issues connected with the gospel, and we uh, had a look at the prologue and some of the things that are going on there. Um, there's, uh, today what we're going to be doing is looking at the first couple of chapters and um, taking some hints from some of the elements in those chapters uh, about uh, larger themes or issues that um, uh, appear elsewhere in the gospel. But basically we're going to be looking at chapters uh, one and two. Um, so last time, uh, let me just um, highlight one, one thing that uh, uh, one of the participants called to my attention, um, something that I didn't emphasize enough or wasn't clear, clear enough about, that one of the pegs on which the whole Logos doctrine hangs uh, and the presentation of Jesus as starting over from the uh, beginning, um, as I was saying last week, we um, looked at the prologue and uh, some of the elements in it. And uh, just to uh, review a couple of points, um, there was uh, one participant in the class who called to my attention uh, the fact that I probably didn't make it clear enough that one of the pegs on which the whole um, Logos uh, business in the prologue hangs. And that's simply the words of um, the book of Genesis that God spoke uh, and things happened. So uh, there's a lot that is developed out of that. Um, or put into it by uh, the fourth gospel on the basis of all of the things that we talked about, the notion of the Shekinah, uh, the uh, wisdom tradition, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but in any case, there is that biblical peg. Mm -hmm. There's clearly an allusion to Genesis in the way in which the prologue opens, NRK, in the beginning. And there are other elements in there that obviously pick up on uh, Genesis. Um, <clears throat> some of the other questions raise some uh, interesting issues, and I just want to mention them, to highlight them. We're not going to go into uh, a lot of detail on some of these uh, matters, but they will come up from time to time. Uh, that is, um, questions of translation. Uh, someone asked about um, the, uh, the wording of 117, uh, which in one translation, the New American Bible, the Catholic um, the liturgical Bible, says grace instead of grace. Uh, and we could look at other Bibles and see what they say. Uh, the word there is anti. And uh, it can mean instead of, and that might have uh, implications for seeing Christianity as the replacement of Judaism, supersessionism. We'll talk a little bit more about that as um, this um, podcast goes on. But that probably doesn't do justice to what uh, John is up to. And so there might be better translations for that word. Uh, grace upon grace or grace responding to grace would also be uh, possible translations. And in fact, the new translation of the New American Bible will have uh, grace upon grace. Um, <clears throat> it's particularly important in the Gospel of John where there are so many plays on words and capturing uh, what the play is, is often very difficult in a simple translation. Um, there are also textual issues. Some people were asking about um, uh, the manuscript witnesses and the text that we have uh, of the Gospel of John. And yeah, there are issues that um, come up from time to time, and we'll uh, spend a little bit of time on some of them. One that's in the prologue that's rather interesting is in verse uh, 18, uh, where we have um, uh, the phrase monogonese the os, or monogonese we os, which means either uh, the only uh, begotten or unique one who is God, or the only begotten or unique one who is the Son. Uh, so which is it? What kind of Christological affirmation is being made there? And why would scribes in great numbers choose one over the other? 
Well, there are all the doctrinal controversies about how uh, Jesus as the second person of the Trinity is related to the Father, and they get reflected in the way scribes are copying the text. And that happens in some other places too. So we'll see from time to time some of these uh, issues, but I just wanted to make sure they were in general on the radar screen. Um, so today we're gonna to be looking at it, um, chapters one and two. And um, chapter one, consists of uh, four days in Galilee, uh, where Jesus um, encounters John the Baptist and the first disciples. And there's a roster of titles of Jesus. And we'll have to think about what some of those titles uh, are about. And then in chapter two, we have the wedding feast and the transformation of water to wine, which is listed as the first of the signs. And sign of what? What is a sign is the larger question that I think we need to wrestle with a little bit. And then there's the incident at the temple, which is not uh, listed as a sign, although interestingly enough, the, uh, the people in Jerusalem ask uh, Jesus what sign he has that enables him to do that kind of business. But what's going on with the incident at the temple? These are things we're going to be looking at uh, today. Uh, but first of all, I want to think a little bit about how all of this stuff is organized, because I think it shows something about the um, the literary sophistication of uh, the fourth gospel. Uh, I've mentioned this in the past and we've talked about uh, some elements of it and we'll be talking about more as we go along. But I think we can see in um, these uh, chapters in particular, uh, an organization of the, the text into diptychs, into sets of two that complement one another in some way or other. So for instance, uh, we have John the Baptist um, matching the first disciples nicely dividing uh, the first chapter into two large chunks. But within each of these chunks, there are also two internal diptychs, if you'll allow me to use that term. Uh, <clears throat> the same thing I think can be said of chapter two, where there's a kind of juxtaposition of uh, the first sign and the first uh, action, that is uh, Cana and the temple. Is this a celebratory sign versus uh, an action of punishment and prophecy? What's the balance? What's the juxtaposition that's going on there. I think we can also see a, a diptych in the two encounters that we're going to be looking at next time. Uh, Nicodemus, who's a male, and the Samaritan woman, who's a woman, uh, inside the Jewish world and slightly outside the Jewish world, within the Samaritan uh, realm. And each of those diptychs has two appended diptychs, coming after it. And we'll have to look at what those are doing once we get to chapters uh, three and four, all of which is kind of wrapped up with um, what is labeled the second sign, uh, the healing of the uh, royal official son in chapter four. So we have a kind of neat package of uh, a set of doubles or diptychs. And I think you could see this uh, principle continuing into the next chunk of the, of the gospel, um, where from chapter five on, we have a different organizing principle. Uh, that is, we have references to Jewish feasts, and we have a kind of sacred calendar that's controlling the flow of things. Nonetheless, the first two elements of this um, new section of the gospel uh, are a nice balanced match, a healing and a feeding. And in each case, we have an internal dyad or diptych, where we have an action and then a discourse. So, uh, this um, dyadic principle seems to be something that John plays with as an organizing thing in a lot of cases, and we'll actually see it again, too, at the end of the gospel and probably in some other places along the way. Um, so let's look at the first diptych, if you will, Jesus and uh, John. <clears throat> the four um, sections of uh, chapter one are marked off as events happening on different days. So it's clear that they're being organized in some way and as a group of four. Uh, on day one, uh, we have in verses 19 through 28, something that's um, familiar. That is the citation of um, Isaiah, Isaiah 40, verse three, of a voice crying in the wilderness. And um, uh, that's familiar to us because it also appears in the gospel of Mark and the opening uh, of that gospel and uh, is echoed in the other gospels as well. Um, but there's a difference too. And we'll be talking more about these differences between uh, John and the, the other gospels as uh, we move along. Uh, because in Mark, we have um, uh, the citation mixed up 
uh, with Malachi 3.1. Here it's just Isaiah 43. Well, what happens on day one? John denies being very emphatically being Christ, Elijah, or a prophet. So if there's one point that, um, uh, that is being made with great clarity, it's who John is not. Um, he also is a, a witness, uh, a witness to someone else who is coming, whose um, uh, shoe he's not, whose sandal he's not worthy to untie. A saying that's familiar, familiar from the Gospel of Mark and also from the other Synoptic Gospels. So there's familiar stuff to those who know uh, Mark or know the tradition about Jesus encountering the Baptist and some un unfamiliar stuff too. There's one other little bit of familiarity that comes with uh, John uh, identifying himself as someone who baptizes with water. And if you remember Mark, um, it says there's someone who's going to baptize with water, with, with uh, Holy Spirit and with fire, not with water. That's not here. It does appear in the next part of the diptych. And this, I think, shows something of the compositional technique of um, the evangelist who takes apart material that he gets from other sources, probably, I think, the Gospel of Mark in this case, and uses it to build up other sections. So on day two, we have John um, bearing witness and saying uh, of Jesus, behold, the lamb who takes away sin. Um, and we also have John um, indicating what the basis of this uh, affirmation about Jesus is. Uh, his testimony is that he saw the spirit descending. And then comes the saying that uh, we have in Mark uh, 1.8b, that he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So you can see that saying uh, taken apart and used in two different sections. Uh, what about this spirit descending and John seeing it? Interesting to compare that with what we get in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, where there's kind of a development. In the Markan version, it's Jesus who sees the Spirit descending upon him. And what's recounted in the Markan version is kind of a call narrative. Uh, Jesus somehow uh, finds the presence of God in this activity that John the Baptist is engaged in and decides to go for it. No indication that he was there from all eternity. Um, and it's he alone that sees the Spirit. In Matthew, the heavens are opened. And so one can infer that everybody has some sort of um, uh, experience of the Spirit descending upon Jesus. Uh, in case you doubted it, Luke makes it quite clear that, that the um, Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove. So it's something that's visible, even tangible to uh, anybody who's there. But what we have in, uh, in the fourth gospel is the testimony of the Baptist. The Baptist who does not baptize Jesus. There's no reference to Jesus being baptized here, okay? So not only is John not Christ, Elijah, or the prophet, neither is he someone who baptizes Jesus. He sees the spirit coming upon him. Um, so what we have here um, is an affirmation about the position of the Baptist, definitely inferior to Jesus. Uh, we have uh, the uh, repeated saying, You're muted again. How did that happen? Okay. Am I coming through loud and clear? All right. Go yes, ahead. you're good. Okay. Uh, I have no idea what's going on with this uh, muting. Uh, the computer seems to have a mind of its own or I'm hitting something in some odd way. In any case, what we have in this uh, first diptych of um, John the Baptist uh, is an affirmation about who he is or who he is not. Um, and also a hint about who Jesus is. Um, we think we, or we may think we know what this hint is telling us, but do we? Um, because it says Jesus is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. What kind of lamb is he? What kind of lambs take away sin? Uh, is there an allusion to the Old Testament here? And if so, to what? Well, possibly to the, um, the chatat sacrifice, that is the sacrifice for sin, which could be a lamb, or it could be the Paschal lamb. And in fact, later on in the gospel, we'll see Jesus being slain at the time the Paschal lambs are being slain. And so 
one might infer that Jesus is the Paschal Lamb. Um, but there's one little problem with that, because Paschal Lambs don't take away sin, at least not in uh, the conventional way that sin offerings do. So what in the world is it, is it to affirm that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? This is something of a riddle, and we're going to find uh, other cases in um, this gospel where there are riddles. Uh, there are things that don't have easy or simple answers. And as soon as you, as you start to think about them, you're driven down a path of reflection. And in fact, I think that's what the gospel is trying to do, drive you down a path of reflection to think more deeply about who Jesus is and what he means. So that's the, the way things begin. Uh, one little diptych, which is part of the larger four-day sequence uh, of two diptychs. The second one, the second diptych um, uh, begins on day three when the first disciples come along. And uh, the affirmation that Jesus is the Lamb of God is repeated. Anytime there's a repetition, pay attention because John is calling our attention to something. And he likes us to think about what it means to call Jesus the Lamb, I think. In any case, two disciples come along, Andrew, the brother of Peter, and someone who is anonymous. And I've made the point before that the anonymity that uh, pervades these scenes probably is contributing to the way in which the character of the beloved disciple functions, because you have to come back and say, well, could it be someone in this scene? Yeah, it could be the anonymous one, but who is he? We can't tell because he's anonymous. In any case, um, in this first encounter, Peter gets a name, Cephas, which is translated Peter. Um, what, what name is he getting? Is it the Ara Aramaic name Cephas? Or does he already have that and he's getting the name Peter? Or does he already have the Greek name Peter and he's getting the name Cephas? Or he doesn't have either one and Jesus is giving him both, an Aramaic and Greek. All of those ways of construing this naming have been suggested by one scholar or another. But the key point is that um, the first disciple, one of the first disciples of, of Jesus, gets this name, Rock or Rocky. And um, I think we'll find as the gospel progresses and as we see Peter doing his um, well-known deeds that he's more at the Rocky end of things. Uh, and John is aware of that. And that's one of the things that John has to uh, resolve when we get to the epilogue in John uh, 21. Uh, in this encounter with the first disciples, there's also a bit of a dialogue. And the dialogue throws out a number of terms repeated. And when you see repetition, pay attention, because the terms might have some significance. And this term does, certainly in the fourth gospel. Um, the uh, disciples ask, where, Jesus, are you staying? Using a Greek word, meno. And Jesus says, well, come and see. Um, the curiosity can be productive. The disciples come along and they saw where Jesus was staying. Have you got my word yet? And they stayed with him. So um, there's a, an attention being called to this word of, of staying or abiding. Here, it, it seems to have a simple uh, physical sense where he is spending the night. Uh, but this is going to have a, a rather deep theological sense when we come to the uh, Last Supper discourses and the farewell discourse of, of Jesus. And one of the things that he's um, uh, saying that he's doing is pr providing a place where people can abide. And their abiding um, involves the abiding in them of uh, the spirit that abides in him. So that's going to become a very important uh, theological word. And the preparation is uh, laid for it here in the encounter with the first disciples. Um, day four. Um, the second half of the second diptych it involves um, Philip um, bringing Nathaniel along and doing so in the same way that Jesus had brought the disciples along in the previous episode by telling him to come and see. Um, we get here, I think, our first flash of irony uh, in two verses. First of all, when Nathaniel says, what the heck good can come from, from Nazareth? Uh, nothing good comes from there, does it? Uh, we, of course, know that, um, yeah, something very good is coming from Nazareth. 
Uh, and Jesus, uh, who says, oh, this Nathaniel is someone, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Uh, is he in fact being a little mocking there? Is there irony in his approach to Nathaniel? Probably so. And sometimes we uh, ignore that. Um, Jesus, in any case, shows some special knowledge. He's seen Nathaniel before and um, sort of knows who he is even before uh, the uh, encounter with him here. And that leads uh, Nathaniel to respond uh, with his confession. Um, that that uh, response to the knowledge that Jesus has is going to be something that we'll see in other cases too, particularly with a Samaritan woman. So Jesus knows what is in humankind. That point is scored a little later on in chapter 2, 25. Uh, no one needs to tell him what's there. And that knowledge is something that um, can elicit a response. And it does so with Nathaniel. And I think the gospel is trying to suggest, well, maybe it should with the reader too. Uh, how is that response going to be um, evoked? Um, Jesus finally says to Nathaniel, after Nathaniel's confession, uh, just wait and you'll see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So it'll be the, there'll be some sort of visionary or epoptic, as I like to call it, experience uh, where um, heavenly truth is revealed or some sort of revelation takes place and um, you will see it. Let's pause on that, um, that saying. Um, and think about uh, what it means. But in order to see what it means, I think we first of all have to see the roster of titles that are uh, put out in this uh, set of encounters with the first disciples and with John. John calls Jesus the Son of God, verse 34, and then the Lamb of God, a title we've already thought about a little bit. The two disciples um, who first meet Jesus call him Rabbi, and uh, our narrator uh, conveniently translates that for us and tells us it means teacher. Is that an adequate um, description of Jesus? Well, it might be truthful. It might be useful to think of him as a teacher, but does it convey everything that um, needs to be conveyed? Probably not. Peter comes along and gives him another title, Messiah. And our narrator again conveniently translates it for us as Christ. Um, and Jesus responds, of course, with uh, naming Peter. Um, but Messiah is certainly one of the titles that applies to, Christ, uh, to Jesus. And, um, uh, but is it all that applies to him? Is, does it capture everything that uh, one wants to say about him? Um, Philip says, uh, Jesus is the one of whom Moses in the law and the prophets all spoke. So points to the, the claim that early Christians make pretty extensively that Jesus is predicted in the uh, pages of the Old Testament. And uh, that's going to be a part of uh, what we find in the fourth gospel too. But is that the um, main thing? Ah, Nathaniel, the one on whom there is no guile, uh, seems to get uh, closer perhaps calling him son of God, just as John did. So he seems to have a level of uh, understanding of um, who Jesus is, that's pretty high, isn't it? Um, but that son of God is equated with king of Israel. No surprise there, because the king of Israel, according to the Psalms and according to the uh, Davidic uh, stories, could be construed as uh, the son of God in some sense, right? Um, is that what the affirmation that the gospel wants us to um, perceive? Well, no, Jesus comes along and says, um, yeah, maybe all of this is true, but uh, just wait, and you'll see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Uh, what in the world is he affirming here? And what is the gospel trying to get us to think about in terms of um, who Jesus is and what his significance is? Uh, in order to probe that a little bit, we have to think uh, a bit about Son of Man language. And this may be familiar to some, um, but um, I'm going to go through it anyhow, because I think it's important to see what's going on in the gospel. Son of man can in uh, Hebrew, first of all, uh, and in Aramaic simply mean human being, as opposed to a son of a beast. Okay? Uh, and in Daniel, book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13, that's what it is. Uh, a human being who contrasts uh, with all of the beasts who have symbolized the kingdoms that have uh, oppressed Israel over time. 
And Daniel 7.13 is a prophecy of the liberation of Israel from that external oppression. Uh, but that text, Daniel 7.13, was um, taken by many in the Second Temple period to be a prophecy of a, a coming Messiah. And so the term son of man comes to have messianic connotations. What do we get in the synoptic gospels? We have the fact that son of man language is something of a riddle, especially as it's used in Daniel 7.13. We have um, Jesus asking in Matthew 16.13, who do people say the son of man is? Referring apparently to the, uh, the book of Daniel and its image of the son of man who gets uh, crowned in heavenly glory. Uh, Mark's version uh, has a slightly different um, uh, version of that saying, who do people say that I am, uh, which reflects the equation of Jesus and son of man. But what does that equation mean? Uh, Jesus can refer to himself um, as the son of man in the present in a kind of oddly um, humble way saying, uh, or uh, an oddly um, demonstrative and uh, uh, forceful way. When he says, for instance, in Mark 2, 28, that the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath, what is he claiming? Is he saying that human beings in general have authority over Sabbath observance? Or is he saying that he, as son of man, uh, the one prophesied in Daniel, has authority over Sabbath observance? A little ambiguous. Um, uh, at the uh, humble end of the spectrum is the same that we find in Q and uh, Matthew 8 and Luke 9, that the Son of Man has no place to lay his head while foxes have their dens and all of that stuff. But the Son of Man, hey, he doesn't have any place. He's, he's a, a charismatic wanderer. Um, so not making any bold claims, it would seem. But then... We have uh, the passion predictions, uh, which are at the backbone of the Gospel of Mark and serve as um, uh, the backbone of the other Gospels on the basis of Mark. Mark 8, 31, 9, 31, and 10, 33, that the Son of Man must go up to Jerusalem and suffer, die, and be resurrected. So the passion predictions are an important uh, way in which the Son of Man language is understood and applied in the Gospel of Mark and in the other Gospels. Um, but then there's um, uh, an even more direct connection with the Danielic expectation of a royal uh, in heavenly enthroned figure and the predictions of um, an eschatological judge that we get in the eschatological discourse of Mark 13. And we get in the trial scene of Mark, Mark 14, 62. And in each of these, there's uh, a reference to some disturbance in the heaven, uh, the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. The heavens are opened, in other words, when the Son of Man comes. And what does he do when he comes? Matthew provides the um, most detailed explanation when in Matthew 25, he talks about the Son of Man in his glory with his angels who judges the sheep and the goats. So the Son of Man, based upon the Danielic image of uh, a human being being enthroned in heaven, comes to symbolize uh, the Messiah in his eschatological judgmental role. That's the tradition lurking behind the fourth gospel. What about the gospel itself? In John, the first image that we get here in John 151 has, I think, its closest relationship uh, to the imagery of the coming son of man that we get in the eschatological discourse of uh, Mark 13 or the trial scene of Mark 14. Um, but it's connected with a different Old Testament text, not with Daniel, but with Jacob's ladder in Genesis 28, 12. That's what the angels ascending and descending evokes. So the heavens get opened, but not at a time of future judgment, as in the book of Revelation, but in the here and now. We'll see that later. It's not clear right here exactly when this is going to be taking place. But this is the uh, way in which the eschatological uh, Son of Man language is appropriated in the gospel. The suffering Son of Man language is also familiar to the gospel. And we'll see that in the next Son of Man um, saying in um, John 3, 13 and 14, which again juxtaposes Son of Man imagery 
with another Old Testament text, not from the book of Daniel. That one is going to be from Numbers 21, where Moses' serpent is lifted up on a staff. And that's what the Son of Man is going to be lifted up. But this Son of Man, according to um, John 3, has already descended from heaven. And his lifting up is a lifting up in glory, not lifting up on a uh, simple stick. Um, that whole business of Jesus being lifted up you know, on the cross uh, is echoed twice in chapter 8 and chapter 12. So in effect, we have a triple passion prediction in John, just as we do in Mark. But the focus is different because of the way in which different scriptures are applied and the way in which the notion of lifting up in glory, which is something derived from Isaiah, um, is applied to the death of Jesus. So what we have as usual in John is appropriation and transformation of traditional material. And then uh, we have those sayings about um, the present son of man running through some of the gospels, particularly in uh, Q material. And the present um, effect of the son of man is something that's there in the fourth gospel in abundance. Son of man has life and the power to judge in chapter five. Does he use it? Mm, we'll have to talk about that. He's the object of belief, belief in whom you see right now, he says to the man born blind. And he is the person who is glorified as the son of man. Now, says Jesus in chapter 13, walk in the light of that glory, he says. So the whole son of man tradition and all of the things that go with it are known to the fourth gospel. The fourth gospel uses that language and uses it in a distinctive way. Um, there is at the end of the whole sequence of Son of Man language in chapter 12, a riddle. Uh, a riddle that the crowd says, who is the Son of Man anyhow? After Jesus gets through talking about Son of Man stuff and applying uh, all of these uh, ways in which it can be understood. Uh, the riddle is answered, I think, finally, um, with Pilate. In chapter 19, in the Ece Homo, a behold the man scene. And remember that Son of Man can mean simply human being. And wherever else that language of behold the man is coming from, and we'll think a little bit more about that in due course, I think it is picking up on um, the basic meaning of Son of Man as human being. And uh, when you ask, where are the angels ascending and descending on the Jacob's ladder, who is the Son of Man? I think the answer that John is finally providing is when you look at him on the cross, when you look at him uh, with eyes that see the truth behind what uh, Pilate unknowingly says uh, when he says, Ece homo, behold the man. Okay, uh, this is all uh, unpacking one little part of one little verse in John 151, which is thrown out there in a way that I think is meant to be provocative meant to get you to think about what it means to call Jesus Son of Man, especially if you know that term from um, the gospel tradition. What has happened to the coming judge, the judge of Mark 13 or of uh, Mark 14? Well, judgment is happening in the here and now, is what John is saying. Eschatology is being realized. One thing that people have noted about the fourth gospel for a long time is that um, the eschatological elements of the Jesus tradition uh, seem to be discarded or minimalized. Discarded is probably not the right word because they're still there. There is a reference to future resurrection and John does not eliminate that hope, but he insists that whatever it is that's going to happen at the end time is already somehow present in our encounter with Jesus in the here and now. Uh, and that's an important part, I think, of what's going on with this uh, Son of Man language. Okay, so I hope you're um, uh, coming up with some questions as uh, I go through this and you're um, sending them in to um, Chrishell, who'll be compiling them and uh, there'll be an opportunity to uh, think about some of the things that I've raised in a, in a moment or two. But let's move on to the next uh, two chunks that we want to look at today. One, the wedding at uh, Cana um, and what it means to um, be a sign. Uh, because this is labeled the first of the signs that uh, Jesus did. Um, 
So we'll step back a, a bit and think about how sign language is used in uh, biblical sources uh, in the New Testament. It can be simply a way of referring to miraculous or wonderful deeds. This happens in the Gospels, in Acts, in Pauline letters, in Hebrews. Uh, so it's uh, standard language, all right. Um, but do these uh, miraculous deeds authorize something? Do they show why it is someone is acting the way he does? Or do they signify something else? Do they provide evidence, in other words, of um, uh, a claim to authoritative status? Uh, that seems to be the presupposition of a lot of the people who are engaged with Jesus throughout the gospel. But the gospel seems to resist that and criticize the search for signs, the search for signs as authorization for something. Because simply seeing an act that authorizes or the evidence that authorizes an act is not enough, says John. You have to probe behind it. And how does one see a sign? By simply observing or by thinking about it, thinking about what it might signify. And I think the gospel definitely says the latter. So how do actions signify in many ways? They can point to the significance of Jesus, all right, as one sent from God. Uh, and these active signs, the deeds that Jesus does, combined with the verbal signs that he throws out, light, shepherd, divine, etc., pointing to the significance of who he is, a complex and um, inviting significance that requires reflection. Uh, there are also pointers to the past that Jesus embodies, that grace upon grace that uh, the prologue was referring to. And we'll see that um, as the uh, Book of Signs develops, where sacred space and sacred time are brought together and connected with uh, the story of Jesus. Um, they're also pointing to the reality that his coming creates. They point, that is, to the, um, the ritual life of the Christian community. And this is something we'll have to probe because it's a matter of, of some debate within uh, Johannine circles, how much of the ritual life of the Christian community is involved in what John is um, uh, laying onto the, the story of Jesus. In some places, it's pretty clear, I think, um, that some sort of gesture toward that ritual life is involved, as uh, in the case of... Um, the, uh, uh, the Samaritan woman and the, uh, the living water, and as also in the case of the bread of life in chapter six. But there's something more complex going on too. And we ought to think about that. In any case, the significance of the signs that Jesus does and the signs that point to him point to something of the continuing reality that his presence has created. And we need to think about what that is. So what about Cana? What's going on with the first sign that Jesus performs? Is it authorizing Jesus to do something? Note that the, at the beginning of the temple episode, we have the crowds asking, what sign can you provide us to, to justify what you're up to? Um, are they thinking about uh, the kind of thing that he did up in Cana, which they of course didn't see, his disciples saw. Um, people are seeking authorization, but Jesus is providing, I think, that and something else. Uh, what is it then at Cana that's being symbolized? Is it that the old is becoming new? Uh, we have the old vehicles of purification, uh, that is the stone jars, which we know as a matter of historical fact was an important part of ritual purity considerations in first century um, uh, Palestine, including uh, Galilee, where we have abundant evidence of stone jars. Um, is it the case that this allusion to stone jars is something like the saying about new wine into old wine skins that we get in uh, Matthew 9 and Luke 5? Possibly, but it's not spelled out. And what's the new wine, if that's the case? Is it the knowledge that Jesus brings? Is it the relationship that he creates? Is it ritual action? Could be any of the above, but it's not stipulated. Uh, so if you're coming to this text with the notion that signs have to signify something, and they might signify something about what's new and what Jesus has brought, you're left with a bunch of options, but no solution. Or could the sign be a sign of the sanctity of marriage? 
Um, why is it that Jesus starts out in the fourth gospel at a wedding? He doesn't do so at the other in the other gospels, and why? Is this perhaps a response to um, some form of early Christianity that takes very seriously the saying on eunuchs in Matthew 19, 12? Uh, there are some who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of God. That is some sort of reference to voluntary celibacy. And John comes along and says, no, marriage is something that Jesus affirms as much as um, celibacy. Or, or is it perhaps a reference to the transformation of marriage into something else, uh, the process of mutual sanctification, and not simply um, uh, a man and woman getting together to support one another and to have children. We see something similar going on in 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul wrestles with uh, marriage and what its significance might be. But the fourth gospel doesn't give an answer to that question. It doesn't say that that's what the uh, miracle at Cana signifies. Uh, is the miracle at Cana really a symbol in some way about the relationship to Jesus? A relationship that here is symbolized by his mother who asks and receives from Jesus, even though he says, it's not my time. We could think a little bit about the dynamics of that little interaction. But in any case, it, this too could be what the whole business symbolizes. And each of these things that I've thrown out there as a possible referent of the symbol has been proposed by one or another, often many interpreters of the Gospel of John. But the interesting thing about this chapter is that there is no indication that any one of them is the preferred referent of this symbol. Uh, and I think that's part of the deliberate strategy of this text. Uh, the Gospel of John starts out slow in some ways. It sows some seeds and it entices you to deeper reflection. Later on, it will spell out in uh, with abundant clarity with some of the signs that Jesus does actually signify. But here it just says, think about it, folks, and meditate on it. And that's what the tradition has done. Many possibilities, no definite answer. Um, what briefly can we say about the role of the mother in this business? Jesus tells her, my time is not yet. And later on, we'll have uh, Jesus declaring that the hour has come when we get up uh, to the Last Supper. Um, but is this, uh, so it has uh, definitely a, a, a role in the overall theological structure of the gospel. Uh, but is this perhaps uh, uh, an adaptation of a story of youthful petulance? Um, we have stories circulating about Jesus uh, of that form. The infancy narrative of um, uh, Thomas, for instance, has Jesus as a uh, rather misbehaving youth. And is this Jesus as maybe a, um, uh, a teen or a young man who, who was brought to a wedding by his mother and uh, gives her a snappy answer, but nonetheless comes around to doing the right thing? Some people have suggested that that's what lies behind this story, and it may be, but John doesn't take it there. What about uh, Jesus calling her woman? Is this Jesus being really nasty to his mother? No, it's not. Uh, woman can be simply a term of uh, respect, rather like ma'am or my, my dear lady, uh, rather than uh, you lousy woman. No, it's not that. But our family ties important? Yes, they are. And I think um, whatever we think about uh, the fourth gospel and its relationship to uh, marriage and um, uh, celibacy, uh, it does make uh, important use of the image of, of the family. Uh, and it will do so particularly on the cross where everything comes together. And what happens on the cross, uh, we have the mother of Jesus being put in the hands of the beloved disciple or the beloved disciple being put in the hands of the mother, but in any case, a new family being created. And the hint of the importance of that family relationship is given here in the relationship between Jesus and uh, his mother. Jesus who does what his mother says, who answers her prayer as the uh, farewell discourses say that Jesus will always do. So if there's an issue out there, a theological issue that some members of the Johannine uh, reading circle are concerned with, it may be, do, does Jesus really hear our prayers? And John says, yes, he does. Uh, and he does so right at the beginning of this text in the uh, Cana episode and does so uh, in spades in the farewell discourse. 
Uh, I've been talking a lot. Let me show some uh, images here that um, uh, I think are uh, fun to have a look at. And um, while I'm doing that, let me also just check the time because we're uh, moving along rather quickly here. Um, uh, this is Giotto from the um, uh, 14th century, uh, focusing on um, Jesus uh, off to the left. Uh, you can see him and you can see the stone jars over on the right. Um, Hieronymus Bosch uh, in the 15th century, similar kind of thing with Jesus at the table. Uh, Jesus is in the center of things in a lot of the portraits of um, the Cana episode. Uh, which suggests to us something of the visibility of this sign. Um, that's abundantly true in something like uh, Paolo Veronese's um, uh, version of the, uh, the wedding at Cana, where we have Jesus in the center of this uh, enormous party in a beautiful um, uh, Renaissance uh, environment, of course. Um, and, um, but is that the way it was? Well, probably not. Uh, and we have this Russian realist of the early 20th century, uh, Konstantin Makovsky, who I think gets that right. That is that Jesus is off to the side, uh, giving instructions to the, uh, the workers with his mother in the background, pushing him on, uh, and not a sign that's a great display of his power, uh, a hidden sign. Uh, and the way in which a sign can be revealed or hidden, I think is, um, uh, put on the table by reflecting a little bit on the dynamics of what's going on here. Okay, very briefly on uh, the cleansing of the temple. Um, uh, it's a familiar story, but has distinctive features. Synoptic accounts um, have, uh, all the synoptic gospels have Jesus doing something in the temple and saying, uh, using a combination of J Isaiah and Jeremiah, don't make the house of prayer a den of thieves. There's another saying that's lurking uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, not in this episode, but brought uh, into the trial of Jesus, that Jesus threatened to destroy the temple. Um, Matthew and uh, Mark have that saying, and Acts has it too. Luke doesn't have it, he puts it in Acts. Uh, this is a saying um, attributed to Jesus by others in all of the circumstances where it appears. In the Johannine diptych, we have um, an action and saying one um, where Jesus uh, talks about the, um, the, the folk in the temple as um, engaging in business, not being thieves, just business people. And the scriptural text that he cites is not from um, Isaiah or Jeremiah, but from the Psalms, which talks about zeal consuming me. But the other saying is in the, um, uh, in the uh, whole Pericope too, in the other part of the diptych, uh, where um, Jesus talks about destroying the temple and his rebuilding it, but he's not referring to the temple as a physical building, he's referring to his body. So interpretation uh, happens. Tradition and interpretation is involved here. Jesus definitely had some sort of action in the temple, a pointed critique of the establishment, uh, and uh, scripture was used to justify that action, whether by himself or by his followers. And there probably was a prophecy that Jesus uttered about the destruction and replacement of the temple. Replacement how? By another temple? By a temple of human beings? A metaphorical temple? Not until totally clear, probably the latter. Uh, John mutes the critique, as we've already noted, um, and he the placement of the story disconnects it from the trial and execution. So it takes the, uh, the sting out of this, uh, this episode, uh, the political and social sting by putting it early. Uh, the scripture uh, refocuses the whole thing, uh, the two scriptural texts that are involved. Um, and uh, the focus is on Jesus, not the temple. As always, the focus is on Jesus, not something else in the fourth gospel. And that's what's happening here. A story about Jesus and his um, uh, political engagement, if you will, is made into a story about himself. Ever so quickly, we have um, versions of this El Greco, um, the uh, great mannerist, 
throwing Jesus out of the temple. That's one of my favorites of El Greco. Well, I've moved along a little rapidly here because we have uh, limited time.